All right, I've just gotten the notice that I think we're at critical mass. So um, I'd like to thank you all very much for joining us this evening uh, for our annual meeting of the Friends of the Public Garden. Um, I had secretly, of course, hoped that we were gonna be in person, um, but here we are again on our new, uh, our new favorite platform, Zoom. Um, so we're, we're super excited uh, about the ability to still connect with all of you. So thank you. Um, I know we're all very familiar at this point, but we would like to remind you about the Zoom guidelines. All of our non-presenters this evening will remain muted. Um, and I'd also like to know that we are recording this evening's uh, meeting so that those people who couldn't join us tonight will be able to uh, watch at a later date. So thank you very much. So this is our agenda for this evening. Um, we're really excited again to, to, to have you all join us this evening. It's been uh, an amazing year for the Friends and a particularly important year for green space and for our three parks. Um, we had a, a, a very quiet period of time when you were all uh, having a quiet period of time at home, but we're very excited that we're back out in the parks and so much important work is, uh, is being done. You may have noticed our post this morning. We're excited that uh, the lagoon has been filled, uh, which always makes us feel that spring is here and uh, feels so hopeful. So um, one of the things that I always love about our annual meeting is the ability to connect with all of you uh, in person and hear your thoughts about the work that is happening in the park and our mission. Um, and so I'm, I'm sorry about that and I'm missing that. Um, as always, uh, I'm easy to reach. So if there's something you'd like to talk to, um, shoot me an email or uh, ask the office uh, to have me give you a call. I would, I would love to chat. Or hopefully I'll see you in the park. Um, we have a number of special guests aside from our speaker this, uh, this evening. Uh, we have a number of our partners in government that I'd like to acknowledge who will be with us tonight. So um, I'd like to say hello to um, Councillor Flynn, Ed Flynn, who's with us, and City Councillor Kenzie Bach, um, our at-large Councillor Andrea Campbell, Anissa Asavi George, Julia Mejia, and Michelle Wu. We also have Senator John Von Corey, Will Brownsberger, Representative Jay Livingstone, and Representative Aaron Mickwitz. Um, we are also pleased that uh, Ryan Woods, Commissioner Woods, is with us this evening. So, and um, at the end of our event, we're having a little bit of a dueling event night tonight because the Greenway is having an event. And we're very excited that at the end of our presentation this evening, uh, Chief Chris Cook, who will be the new executive director of the Greenway, um, is gonna join us for a few moments uh, and to say a few words. So um, if you'll stick with us at the end of the night, you'll have a chance to see uh, Chief Cook. And uh, anyways, one of the great celebrations this year, of course, of our 50th anniversary is celebrating our 50 years of partnership with the city of Boston, you know, creating these parks of excellence. Um, and that couldn't have been done without um, Chief Cook and Commissioner Woods. Um, so we're very excited. I'd like uh, Commissioner Woods perhaps to have a few moments to speak to you this evening. So thank you, Commissioner Woods. Thank you, Leslie. Um, thank you, everyone. It's nice to be here. Um, I want to say first thank, first and foremost, thank you to the friends and all the members for your advocacy, your support, and your love for the common, the garden, and the mall. Um, your work to protect and improve Boston's first parks does not go unnoticed. And this partnership that we have set up serves as the lead example that all of our 161 friends groups strive for. As you may have seen, and as Leslie just mentioned, the lagoon was filled this past weekend. So we're excited as we're coming back into some normalcy. Um, the swan boats uh, will be returning on May 8th. Um, and later this month, our tulips will be in bloom. So we're very excited for that. We're excited for the rollout of the Boston Common Master Plan uh, late spring, early summer this year. And we're anxious for work to begin uh, on the damage that was done at the garden entrance on Charles and Boylston Street. We've awarded that project uh, and the masonry work and the casting of the gates will begin uh, in early May. So uh, we continue to work with the friends uh, on King Boss and King Boston to advance the memorial. And we're, we're thrilled for the return of the 54th Regiment Memorial uh, to the common and look forward to unveiling it later next month and a formal rededication later this fall. 
Um, the first signature event that we'll have returning to the common is the 37,000 flags planted by the mass military heroes uh, for Memorial Day. Uh, and this year, those volunteers who are planting the flags are all frontline workers, fully vaccinated uh, frontline workers uh, participating. And I just wanna end with saying that this past year was a tough one, but one highlight from this pandemic was seeing the important role parks played in all of our lives. Parks were and continue to be welcoming spaces where people can gather in groups or come alone, a place for respite, rejuvenation, recreation, a place to celebrate and a place to demonstrate. Parks are often said as uh, they are the lungs of our city. They filter the air, they recharge the groundwater, sequester carbon and mitigate impacts from climate change. This year more than ever, parks were on the front line. And thanks to all of your efforts, these three downtown parks were welcoming places for so many during difficult times. Congratulations on another successful year. And I look forward to working with you to continue to strengthen this important partnership. Thank you. Brian, thanks very much. We're pretty excited too. Um, we're looking forward to the next year, the next 50 years ahead. So um, I'd like to take this opportunity, if I could please, to uh, call for uh, a vote for the BD minutes from last year from our annual meeting. Um, if I could please ask for a motion for the approval of our meeting minutes from last year. Do I have a I second? See. Yes. Great. And if you would all be very kind and uh, approve the minutes uh, with the, the um, radio buttons that have appeared on your screen, that would be great. Thank you. And we'll wait a moment and I'll, I'll get the acknowledgement that we've had our vote. Can't imagine that we won't pass, but we will wait. And uh, we're good. All right. Well, thank you very much. Um, I appreciate everybody participating. So thank you again. Um, now, with that, I'd like to turn over to uh, Kate Enroth to give our governance report from uh, our, she is our governance chair. So, Kate, with that. Thank you, Leslie. Uh, good evening, everyone. The Governance Committee of the Friends of the Public Garden recommends the election of the following persons to the Board of Directors for a three-year term beginning in April 2021. Kate Enroth, Barbara Moore, Catherine O'Keefe, Ann Swanson, and Roger Takeff. Respectfully submitted by the Governance Committee, Kate Enroth, Patty Quinn, Leslie Singleton-Adam, Brent Shea, Jeff Mullen, Margaret Picorne, and Liz Visa. And with that, I'd like to make a motion that the five individuals named in the committee report be elected to the board of directors. If I could have a second. Kate, I'll second your motion. Thank you, Jim. And now you can see the poll is up for you all to vote. Yeses have won, Kate. It sounds like we are a yes. We are a yes. That's great. I'd like to take this opportunity as well to um, thank, uh, we have three departing board members, um, Bear Albright, Patty Quinn, and Linda Cox. Um, three, uh, Patty Quinn and Linda Cox, very longtime board members who we're going to miss uh, all their work, and Bear Albright, who um, came knocking at our door to ask us about the white fountain. So we put them right to work. So I wanna thank you all very much for all the work you've done with us here at, uh, at the Friends. 
So with that, I think we're going to turn it over to uh, Jim Bordewick, who is our new treasurer this year here at the Friends. And so, Jim, thank you. Great. Thanks so much, Leslie, and good evening, everybody. <clears throat> In the next uh, five minutes or so, I want to do three things. I want to give you a brief overview of the 2020 year, spend a little bit of time talking about the <clears throat> pie charts and related material that was part of the meeting materials, and give you a little bit of a sneak preview about how things are going so far this, uh, this current fiscal year in 2021. So how did the Friends do in 2020? The Friends worked really hard to achieve a strong year despite the pandemic. This resulted in an excellent finish to an unprecedented and challenging fiscal year characterized by new and shifting uncertainties. We ended with a strong cash position. And we're very proud that we retained all of our staff, didn't have any layoffs or furloughs. So, so how is that possible? Uh, first, we continue to benefit enormously from the generosity of our supporters and members like all of you here tonight. At the start of the pandemic, uh, the Friends rapidly moved to revise their budget, adjust expenses, and rescale activities. And I want to give a big expression of thanks and gratitude to my predecessor, Bill Clendenial, for his uh, leadership and vision. Uh, he was instrumental in positioning the Friends to make a timely and intelligent pivot to an already in place contingency plan and budget when the pandemic struck. And these results were also driven by the creativity, the resilience and the dedication of the staff and the responsible financial management of Liz, Steve Tenbarge, who's our finance manager and the Brewer Fountain liaison and all the friends staff and the stewardship of the board. This is all accomplished without taking any PPP loans. And we, end, we just recently received our, our clean audit report, no issues, exceptions, or observations for the last fiscal year. So looking at the pie charts, um, from an income perspective, total income last year was $3.1 million. That was 14% lower than the $3.6 million in the prior year. Support, and you'll see support is a major part of our income. Support consists of membership, designated, undesignated contributions, bequests, and special events. That was 16% lower than the previous year, primarily due to the cancellation of the green and white gala. Sponsorships for benches and trees were down 25% compared to 2019, but they still exceeded our budget for 2020. And then in spite of you know, economic conditions resulting from the pandemic, membership renewals came in 4% higher than the prior year, demonstrating the continued relevance and importance of the friends to our members during the pandemic. Some events morphed and some couldn't take place at all. For example, the Duckling Day and the Making History on the Common events went virtual. And unfortunately, the Brewer Fountain Plaza programming was canceled. Uh, rolling three-year average for our investments measured at September 30th, 2019 for the 2020 draw from our endowment increased from 18.6 to $20.1 million. And this is important because it gives the friends increased to growing support from this formula draw from the endowment to fund our current operations. Uh, next slide, please, on expenses. There we go. Uh, total expenses for 2020 were two and a half million dollars. And that was 16% lower than the almost $3 million spent in 2019, offsetting the 14% decrease in income. Parks care spending came in 48% lower than the prior year, but we were still able to maintain our goal of providing essential tree, turf, and soil care work and some sculpture maintenance in the park. We're excited to return to a more normalized expense level to support and promote parks care this year. Spending on public programs was higher due to the 50th anniversary temporary art project on the common, which will be installed this fall. In the development space, we saved the expenses of the canceled green and white gala, but we did add the cost of a consultant who provided critical development and 50th anniversary campaign help after the departure of our development director early in 2020. The consultant also led to a successful search for a new vice president of advancement and external affairs, Lynn Flaherty. The decrease in administration expenses resulted primarily from the cancellation of the in-person annual meeting last year, and unfortunately again this year, and a reduction in office operations. Uh, as a result of the, um, of, uh, the relationship between expenses and income, we were able to transfer $580,000 to temporary restricted funds for tree work in the three historic parks and the 50th anniversary, and the 50th anniversary projects in 2021. 
And at the end of the, at the, end of the year, we ended up with a very small net surplus, $2,000. Um, turning to our statements of financial position, the headline here is that ass, our assets were up by 10%, liabilities were down by 15%, and our total net assets were up slightly more than 10% in all cases compared to 2019. <clears throat> Investment performance for 2020, despite a, a volatile year, was up 14%, which was in line with our benchmark. And our performance remains in the top 25% of the Cambridge Associates universe of endowments of less than $100 million. The increase in pledges receivable <clears throat> was due to pledges made for the 50th anniversary campaign, decrease in accounts payable, was due to payments made to the Shaw 54th uh, project contractors. So in closing, here are a few comments on our current fiscal year. Our strong results from 2020 put us in a very sound position going into 2021. We developed and the board approved two versions of budgets. One is called an essential budget, and it largely continues the expense controls and income expectations from the revised 2020 budget, sort of a rainy day budget. Uh, the, and then the other budget is a much more optimistic one called the expanded budget. And it moves us closer to a more normalized budget and increases funding for parks care. So here we are in the middle of April, uh, more than a quarter into our way into our new year. I'm proud to say that conditions have allowed us to manage to the expanded budget so far this year. So thank you very much. And I wanna pass it on to Liz who will give her president's report. Thank you so much, Jim. Welcome everybody, great to have you here. Before I talk about our work, I want to acknowledge that our parks occupy what was unceded land, marshlands and waterways of the Massachusetts nation, today known as Boston. We acknowledge the painful history of forced removal of indigenous peoples from their land and that the work of repair is ongoing. In the spirit of the Massachusetts people, past, present and future, we acknowledge that we live in a bond of reciprocity with the plant and animal relatives who call our parks home. We honor the gifts given to us by this land and return them with our care. And that care was very beautifully received as a gift from all of you. We heard from so many of you how these parks were lifesavers in this year. People came to have dinners in the parks in every one of the parks. Kids were there in the middle of the day because they were at home with their parents. So our parks were indeed lifesavers this year. And the work we do together is so important, not just for recreation and for gathering to celebrate, but also to protest. Uh, our parks have been woven into the fabric of democracy and particularly the Boston Common for generations has been a place where we go to make our voices heard and speak truth to power. So in this time of racial reckoning and the common was at the center of this and very important to that. This year we've been deepening our commitment to diversity, equity and inclusion. We've hired a consultant, Gwen Haddon, and, and doing work dual, with a dual goal of making our organization as well as our parks more diverse, inclusive and welcoming. And as part of that work, Gwen has done a series of interviews with community leaders and other communities in, of, the, of the city and other neighborhoods. And what she has heard is that people of color from other neighborhoods don't see our parks as relating to their lives. And that if there were events that reflected their cultures or included people of culture, cult color, they would feel more welcomed and more included. Which brings us to a wonderful opportunity that we have taken up with the Boston Children's Chorus. We are working with the chorus already to uh, have them sing an original commissioned piece to celebrate the rededication of the Shaw 54th Memorial. And we learned from the chorus that they want to bring a series of concerts to neighborhoods throughout the city and to gateway cities in the state, particularly underserved cities, uh, communities. And they'd like to begin or end this series of free concerts on the common. So we are excited to be supporting them on this, on this journey and being their partner in, in bringing these concerts both to the common and to other communities. Social justice is at the heart of the, of the mission of the chorus and it's a gift from an urban park leader that can provide that gift both for our parks and to bring these, these people and this wonderful opportunity and these free concerts to other communities. So we're very excited to be working with the chorus on that. You heard from Jim about the numbers, about the reduction in, in spending last year, but then we were able to do a lot of our essential work is still the most important things that we do. We were able to do again because of the resources that we have from all of your support. 
I also just want to give a shout out to our volunteers. They continued to come this year, even though it was the year that it was, they came socially distant and masked. This year is going to be the 34th year of the Rose Brigade and the sixth year of the Border Brigade. The Border Brigade, thank you in particular to the Garden Club of the Back Bay, who was the backbone of the Border Brigade this last year. And we're looking forward to the tour guys coming back. We don't know when we can have them back, but we really are looking forward to them. You know, I will say that our staff has been amazing this year. They did not skip a beat in pivoting to being in a virtual world. They've been incredibly busy doing the work of parks care and development support and communications and advocacy. I'm just so inspired by the team that we have working on behalf of, of you, the friends and the parks. I always start with the bones of the parks, the green space, because without trees and turf, we would not have a park. And uh, we were able to continue to do the wonderful soils work that we started last year. On the bottom left, you see liming of the mall and we've done comprehensive soil testing throughout the entire uh, acreage of all three parks to understand what nutrients need, need, needs there are, what the pH level is. And so the liming there is raising the pH in the mall. On the right is not an image from last year. As you know, we did not have a big uh, group of people coming to the park, but a lot of people do continue to come. It gets intense amount of, of use and the turf is really important to care for in, a, in an urban park, particularly ones that are as intensively used as ours. So we continued our turf care work. This year, we helped the parks department by taking over mowing of the mall. They had challenges with their equipment. So we were able to do that. And we are gonna continue that, that uh, mowing this year. And in the tree realm, we continued our elm preservation program. The elms have survived their own pandemic, Dutch elm disease, and we're working hard to maintain the 400 elms we have left in our, in our three parks, as well as monitoring the health of all the other trees. We continue sculpture care work, but in a reduced level because of our, our reduction in, in uh, expenditure last year, but some important places that we don't reduce that care is the fountains. Fountains, again, are joyous things in our parks because we have an endowment for sculpture care. And thank you to all of you in this room that have supported the, the Lee Sculpture Endowment. It means that even if we have a year where we have less income, we can still make sure we do that critical care work. And the fountains need a lot of care because they're fussy. Keeping fountains working is hard and it's important. And that's why our plumbers out there every other week during the season to, to care for them. We continue to uh, work towards protecting the sunshine in our parks, particularly the common and the garden, which are impacted by the, the development downtown. So as the city grows, it is possible to continue to protect the existing level of sunshine in these two parks. And we worked with our consultant that did the shadow studies for us during the Winthrop Square chapter four years ago to identify through a modeling process how much development is possible downtown and still protect the existing amount of sunshine. And the good news is that there is quite a lot of development that is still possible. So you elected officials who are here today, we are working to translate this technical uh, assessment into layperson's terms and, and uh, to meet with all of you to show you, to share the outcome of this study. And we want it to be have teeth. We want it to either be in zoning or an overlay district, just like the uh, groundwater is protected in the back bay with an overlay district. So stay tuned we'll be talking to you soon about that and as Ryan said we're nearing the end of a two-year process of uh, creating a master plan for our first park in the country reimagining this park and we have had responses and input from over 10,000 people in this process both through surveys and in-person uh, little pop-up the parks, which you see on the, on the right hand side, we went to neighborhoods around the city to talk to people about the People's Park. This is a park that belongs to everybody. On the left is an image of improving use nodes. This is behind the visitor center to create a little plaza area to welcome people from the visitor center into the heart of the park and expand the visitor center as well for more information and interpretation. You see the embrace, the, the um, monument that you will be hearing about soon in the, in the left side, uh, on the right hand side of that perspective. So we're very excited about the proposals and it should probably be in about a month that you'll be seeing that and then we'll be able to uh, finalize that project and that, that plan and then start to implement it. One thing we didn't do this last year and it was a very sad year for uh, the Brewer Fountain Plaza, not having activation. This is a very important place. It's one of the most popular living rooms in the city when it's uh, fully activated with tables, chairs, the uh, jazz musicians coming at lunchtime to play in our piano, the food trucks. 
we hope we can get back out there this summer. We're not sure exactly which month it will be, but we're watching uh, the health guidelines to find the place and the time that we can get out there. It, we really miss it. And uh, as you all know, positive activity is really important in a park. And there was a, a sad t time and, and actually more you know, challenging time here without that positive activity. There, there are times when there were illicit activities here more than we normally see because we were not out there in the, in the plaza. So watch for this. We hope to be out there before the end of the summer. And another thing we'll be bringing back out in June is our pilot bathrooms. We didn't do it again last year because of COVID, but 800 people a day use these bathrooms when we have them out. We had them for two years, the two previous seasons, and it really is a test for the importance and the need for more bathroom facilities. So in the master plan, we've recommended expanding bathroom facilities in a number of places in the common. It's really an important need, and particularly this last year for the unhoused population, when restaurants were closed and shelters were at half capacity, it was a hardship for everybody. As Ryan said, we're almost completing the uh, two-year restoration process for the Shaw 54th Memorial. On the left, you see the bronze returning on site to be placed on its new foundation. And on the right, stone elements that are coming back to be uh, repositioned around the, the bronze. So we'll be unveiling it over the Memorial Day weekend. Uh, come and see us. We'll be having a, a book so you can sign as a witness to history, and then we'll be rededicating it in the fall. An equally important aspect of this work has been using it as a platform for dialogue on race and social justice issues. And this year we had three wonderful virtual conversations. Thousands of people came to discuss and, and listen to really um, provocative panelists talking about voting rights in the, in the perilous march to freedom, talking about allyship in the 54th. When we rededicate this memorial, we need to dedicate and rededicate ourselves to the vows of, of fighting for, for justice. It's not just a monument, it's a monument that tells a story. And if we're gonna honor the sacrifice that these men made in the Civil War, we have to be active in that, in that advocacy work today. Going to the garden in a little but a very important building is called now to term the tool shed, but in the 19th century, it was a place for a women's bathroom, women and children bathroom facility, beautiful stick style uh, design. And as you can see on the left, it's in Pretty terrible shape. Um, very exciting news that Ryan, thank you so much for putting it in the Parks Department budget for a design study for this. And thank you, Kim Janey, Mayor Janey for keeping it in the budget. And thank you, Councillor Bach for advocating for it to be in the budget. We're gonna be working to support that and lifting this building up and shining a light on it by doing a design workshop with the Parks Department and Boston Society of Landscape Architects, bringing our historic architects and landscape architects together to envision a, a renovated building, but also as an area outside the building for orientation and welcoming for the visitor to the garden. So when somebody comes and they're new to the garden, they can learn about it. They can learn about the history and also learn about the friends that are across the street. We are again in virtual land for Duckling Day and making history on the common, Duckling Day on, Mar on Mother's Day. Uh, we're going to have an exciting aspect of, of Duckling Day where we're going to be having the book uh, Make Way for Ducklings read by a variety of stellar casted people, including uh, Senator Elizabeth Warren and uh, a member of the aquarium residency and a penguin from the aquarium who will be helped by a, a human uh, support system. And I really cannot wait to get back out on, on the site and, and in the park to see a thousand Boston school children loving making history on the common. We provide resources for them, but it's just not the same as being in real time, which is why it's particularly exciting that the, that the swan boats are coming back. And I think maybe Lynn Paget, you're in the room. We're very excited that you've figured out a way to get them back in. As Ryan said, they're coming back on May 8th, the day before Mother's Day. They will start part-time Friday, Saturday, Sunday until June 20th and then be full-time. So we're very excited that they have made their way back into the lagoon. Our parks have been at the center of civic life in Boston for hundreds of years. And our work over the last 50 years has been critical in restoring and, and advocating for the future of these parks. They are the way they are because of our partnership with the city over this half century and because of all of your support. We wouldn't be able to do it without you. We're very excited about the next 50 years and we are celebrating that by 
working on three transformative projects. And thank you again for those of you who have supported these projects up until now. We are gonna be going into a public phase on May 1st where we'll be uh, telling the world about it and encouraging people to contrib contribute. And we'll finish this, this uh, campaign over the next year. But here are these three projects. On the right is uh, the mall. We are lighting all the statues on the Commonwealth Avenue Mall from uh, Arlington Street and Ham Alexander Hamilton and to, uh, to Charles Gate and uh, Leif Erikson. So Morrison, which you see here two years ago, got lit. This year, we're finishing the Collins, which you saw beginning last year. We also hope that Garrison and Sarmiento will be two more uh, sculptures we can light this year. On the lower left, a very exciting project in the public garden. The main entrance into our garden off Arlington Street is a bit of a disappointment. You see these beautiful child fountains that don't work and haven't worked for decades. So we are gonna be restoring those fountains as well as revitalizing the landscape at the entrance. And on the upper left, we're very excited about this a temporary art installation called What Do We Have in Common? We are working with curators now and there and nationally recognized uh, artist, Janet Zweig. She conceived of that question before the pandemic, before the Black Lives Matter protest and, and our reckoning of, of racial injustice and the need for justice. So the question of what do we have in common has become increasingly deeply relevant to all of us. And it's at the heart, the core of the work that we do as, as caretakers of these parks and all of us together. So it'll be interactive. You see these people with blue coveralls are gonna be engaging with people every day, talking about questions about what do you, I have in common with you and, and who takes care of this park and how can we work together to make sure our common resources are in the best condition possible. It's gonna be whimsical and fun and engaging. It will be over the month between mid-September and mid-October. So stay tuned for that. And on April 30th, we're having our virtual gala, 50th anniversary celebration. Um, we would love for you to come. We normally are in real time, as you know, but this year is virtual. And this event every year raises 20% of our parks care budget. It's a significant event and significant amount of support for the work that you just heard me talk about and we do in these parks. So I encourage you to come. It's, uh, we put together a beautiful video of memories, moments and milestones, images from the seventies and today uh, to today and people enjoying the parks. It's just a really beautiful, inspiring uh, event that I think you'll really enjoy. So take a look at the website and, and join us that day. And lastly, it's really important Yes, our mission is caring and advocating for and enhancing the common, the garden and the mall. And these parks live within a larger ecosystem of parks within the city of Boston. We work through the Boston Park Advocates to make sure that parks are in the front of line of thinking of our elected officials and the powers that be to understand that without healthy, sustainable park systems, we do not have a livable city. Half of our acreage is state acreage, half is city acreage. And we are now entering into a season of an open mayoral campaign. So we're gonna be working hard to make sure that every mayoral candidate understands the critical importance of, of parks to Boston. And uh, we will be having a forum. We will be have, putting out uh, information and getting sponsorships. We wrote a letter to, uh, to Mayor Janey. We have wrote our own letter from the, from the friends, but also wrote a letter from Boston Park Advocates and 64 organizations signed that letter and dozens of individuals did. So it really does show the mayor and other elected officials the power and the importance of the parks community. I just wanna uh, end by saying thank you. Thank you to all of you. Thank you for your support. Thank you for your advocate voices. Thank you for loving these parks and de dedicating yourselves to them through the friends. We could not do the work that we do without all of you. So thank you so much. And now it is my great pleasure to introduce our honored guest, Imari Paris Jeffries, Executive Director of King Boston. Imari brings a wealth of experience from the nonprofit management, community activism, education reform and social justice sectors and has served in executive roles at Parenting Journey, Jumpstart, Boston Rising and Friends of the Children. He serves as a trustee of the UMass system as well as on the boards of USES, Providers Council and Governor Baker's Black Advisory Commission. He is a three-time graduate of UMass Boston and is currently pursuing his PhD through UMass Boston's higher education program. 
I don't know how you're doing it all, Amori, but we were here. We're looking forward to hearing you. I'm gonna now stop sharing my screen so Amori can share his. Thank, thank you for having me, Liz. And it's it's so great to be with uh, friends, um, both figuratively and literally. Um, it's, uh, you know, the park is such an important institution for our city. And so there, there seems to be no, no better way for us to honor the park system and uh, the legacy of the Kings then to, to have um, the embrace be a part of the park. So I am going to share my screen. And so excited to be here and, and thank you to the elected officials. Also, I saw Councillor Bach in the audience um, for being here. And, and just to start off, and Liz gave a, a land acknowledgement, and I also want to just give an equity acknowledgement as we begin the statement. So, so bear with me as I read. Uh, as we cannot gather in person, I'd like you to I'd like to invite you to consider the legacy of colonization embedded within our technologies, structures, and way of thinking we use every day. We are using equipment and high-speed internet not available in many communities. So I invite you to join me in also acknowledging all of this and our shared responsibility to make good of this time and for each of us to consider our roles in reconciliation, decolonization, and allyship. And so I think one of the things that many of us are beginning to fully understand is the King's relationship to Boston. And they met in the 50s. And so un unlike other cities, uh, the Kings and Boston have a relationship uh, that is connected. We, we are the home place of this important family. And so there, there's a universe where Boston was a much more friendlier, welcoming, racially just city in the 50s, and that the Kings decided that after they finished college, Mrs. King at New England Conservatory, Dr. King at BU, they decided to stay in Boston and make it the epicenter of the civil rights movement. And so that universe didn't happen. Uh, we didn't live in that world. And so in this post pandemic universe, we have the opportunity to imagine what it would be like for Boston to reopen post pandemic, post vaccine as the epicenter of the, the new anti-racist movement, the city on the hill that we always aspire to be. And so uh, I'm excited to be with you today to be a part of that universe and to imagine uh, what Boston could be like post pandemic. And so when we think about this, this time, the civil rights movement, we, we think about Boston's role and frame the time between 1963 and 1967. And so Boston had an important role in the civil rights movement. And so we know about the Kings, uh, both Dr. and Mrs. King's time in Boston, uh, but there are many Boston leaders who are unsung, uh, like Reverend Michael Haynes, like Ruth Batson, like Reverend Carter, like Reverends Breeden and Carter, uh, like Reverend Virgil Wood, like Margaret Mosley, Reverends Reed, Reverend Gill, and these two down here, if you can see my cursor, uh, a young Mel King and Hubie Jones. And so Boston is known uh, for a lot of things, but we, we are not known for some of the leaders. And so this in, in this time of um, racial understanding and anti-racism, we wanna raise up these other important leaders. And so when I think about uh, King in the 60s, and as you know, they, they returned, Dr. and Mrs. King returned on April 23rd, 1965 uh, for the historic 1965 Freedom Rally. And so towards the end of Dr. King's life, uh, his mission had expanded um, from civil rights, but also included workers' rights, also included housing, also included education. And so this was one of uh, an excerpt from his speech uh, at the Parkman Bandstand, so I'm going to just take a second to read it. It would be irresponsible of me to deny the crippling poverty and injustice that exist in some sections of this community. The vision of the new Boston must extend into the heart of Roxbury. Boston must be a testing ground for the ideal of freedom. And so again, reimagining what the world would be like, reimagining what Boston is like now, post pandemic, we have the opportunity uh, to be the city on the hill that we aspire to be. And so when we think about placemaking, we think about these two important pieces on the map. And so the 1965 Freedom Rally started in Nubian Square, started in Roxbury and ended, it in the, ended at the public garden. And so these two important places for Boston, the public garden, Boston Common, 
uh, the oldest park in the country, Boston's economic heart, and Nubian Square, the physical geographic center of the city and the heart of Black Boston are important places as we think about placemaking in this time of racial reckoning. And so this is a, a, an artifact of when King and the marchers finally made it to the common. So this is at the Parkman bandstand. And so, um, you know, estimates around 15,000 people uh, participated in some way, shape or form in this march. And so it was a very significant and monumental for our city. And so there were four important um, themes that the marchers marched behind and rallied behind. And so they were problematic in 1965 Boston's, let me know if you think they're still familiar. And so they marched for poverty because poverty was, in, was problematic in Boston. Uh, they marched for housing. Uh, this was the redlining era of Boston, but housing um, was problematic in Boston in 1965. Racial equity was problematic in 1965 and education. And so again, this was the Louise Day Hicks um, Boston School um, segregation time in Boston, but education was problematic in Boston in 1965. And so a few years ago, uh, a group of community leaders led by Paul English um, really conceptualized the idea of honoring Dr. King's time in Boston. And this, this idea of honoring Dr. King expanded to honoring Dr. and Mrs. King, as well as other civil rights leaders of Boston uh, into the embrace. And so there was a contest in a few years ago, 126 submissions, five finalists, and the winner was selected through a community vote, Hank Willis Thomas, who is an internationally renowned artist and sculptor. And he was responsible for much of the art in the EJI National Lynching Museum, as well as other places nationally. And Mass Design Group, their, their um, submission was selected. And so this photograph was the inspiration, the embrace uh, for the, the piece of art that I'm about to show. And so this was the moment that Dr. King had discovered that he had won the Nobel Peace Prize. And the first thing uh, that he wanted to do was embrace, uh, embrace his wife. And so this is the, the latest and greatest um, rendition of the embrace. And so some of you may have seen it in the papers. It is, it is less shiny than it was. Um, and I think through community process, we realized that it was important for this piece of art to match the, the natural topography and style and aesthetic of the common. And so it is in a mat that is similar to the Shaw Memorial. And so it is important that uh, it, it, it blends in, but at the same time makes a statement. So this was a couple of weeks ago, just joking. Um, we really imagine uh, because the common is a four season park that this will be uh, a four season memorial. And uh, this is just another view. Uh, you, you get a sense of where it's situated in the common. Uh, this is an, another view. Uh, it is 22 feet, three stories high. Um, and, 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 and it is uh, expected to be experienced through high touch. Uh, we want people to walk in it. Uh, we want people to uh, touch it and experience what it means to be a part of Boston in, in this great park. And so this is an aerial view. And I think I began the presentation by acknowledging and honoring uh, some other Boston civil rights leaders. So part of the process um, of the, the um, the sculpture is the 1965 plaza, and these placards on the plaza represent the name of 35 civil rights leaders, some of which I mentioned, I think I mentioned 13 of them. And so we're beginning a community process to name uh, 35 Boston civil rights leaders who were um, monumental and instrumental during that time. And so as the, the moment in time is called for, and you know, I think we, we've experienced um, the, the convergence of three pandemics, an economic, uh, a, a viral, and, and a racial pandemic. We knew that, that monument, stone, and steel were no longer appropriate as markers um, of, of great men or great people, and that, that monuments and markers needed to represent values. And as a part of the um, overall values, we knew that racial equity for our city was an important aspect of King Boston and the Embrace Memorial. And so another important aspect, and again, you know, going back to this slide, we talked about these two points in the map. 
The King Center for Economic Justice is an, another important part of the overall King Boston Embrace experience. And so this is imagined as 25,000 square feet of museum, gallery, co-working, community, farming uh, space uh, in Nubian Square that connects the common uh, to Roxbury. And so again, uh, matching the original route of the 1965 um, Freedom Corridor. And so as we think about the work of the King Center, there are themes that are still problematic in Boston. Uh, some might argue more problematic than they were in 1965. And so we are still talking about poverty. And so we reframed the work of uh, eliminating poverty to building wealth. Uh, we are still having conversations about affordable and fair housing. Uh, we are still having conversations about racial equity in the city. And we're still having conversations about an e education system uh, that guarantees um, knowledge and prosperity for those who are part of our education system. And so this is the work of the King Center for Economic Justice, uh, which is a, a, a home for research data and grassroots organizing. And then the last part of uh, King Boston is embrace ideas. And so, you know, in shorthand, if you could imagine if the King Center is our Aspen Institute, embrace ideas is our Aspen ideas. And so we imagine in this time of racial reckoning, not everyone can engage in conversations about racial justice through data, research, or grassroots organizing. There has to be different ways in which folks can engage in that discourse. And so Embrace Ideas is that way for folks to engage through the arts, through journalism, through culinary experiences, through walks in the park. Uh, and so some of the programming that you might've seen take place already, uh, Voices on King, which was a program of leaders who reflected on the year that we've had during the pandemic uh, that played on Dr. King's birthday. And so this will be an annual, annual televised uh, offering uh, that we'll have. Embrace conversations, much like the conversation that we're having today. Uh, they're happening virtual, but they are in partnership. Uh, they are panels. They are TED Talk style conversations uh, where we're talking about issues, contemporary issues around how to make our city more inclusive. Uh, it is the Embrace Vibes music series. And so it is a series of musical events, some of which uh, we hope will take place in, in the common. Uh, and it's a way for us to engage in anti-racist discourse through our, our common love of music, through our common love of sound. It is our art as a residence program. And so we understand the, the power um, of art activists. And so we've just uh, commissioned four artists and residents as a part of our um, overall strategy to uh, engage in anti-racist discourse. And then finally, when we unveil the embrace in 2022, and this is an aerial view um, of the embrace, uh, it is the Embrace Ideas Festival. And so it is an annualized festival of music, arts, TED Talks, um, film festivals, ideas uh, that will hopefully bring us all together uh, the first one being in 2022 is a partnership of right now about 25 other nonprofits and organizations to officially open Boston to say Boston is here to stay. And we imagine that uh, newly minted Labor Secretary Walsh will come back with his best friend, Vice President Harris, break the champagne bottle over the embrace and open Boston as a new city committed to racial equity, committed to being the city on the hill, committed to being the most welcoming city. And so I want to thank you for, for uh, giving me a few space uh, and some time to talk about uh, King Boston and the vision for the Embrace in the Common and the overall vision for the organization. Uh, and so I'm going to stop sharing and um, hopefully uh, engage in a dialogue. Great. Well, that's very exciting, Amari. Thank you so much. It's given us a much broader and deeper understanding of the vision of King Boston and a broader understanding of what all the pieces are that that you're uh, coming to bring, being. I, I didn't even realize that there was as much uh, construction concept for the for the center in the Nubian Square, Square as there is. I'd love to hear you talk a little bit about how all these pieces intersect, how the work at Nubian Center will connect with the work of the Embrace and how they can you know, mutually reinforce one another. Yeah, yeah, you, you know, and I think, I think, uh, you know, when we think about, you know, all the important um, places that that Boston has to offer, uh, we, we, we realize that there is a natural connectivity um, with with the common, 
uh, really being our city's park. Uh, and so, you know, bringing and tying Nubian Square to the common felt like an important step for us as, a, as a, an act of bringing the city closer together. And so we see, you know, we, we're, it's a, it's a, a large um, public art installation. And so, you know, there, there's got to be a way to tell Boston's story beginning at the embrace, uh, taking the 1965 Freedom Corridor walk or Segway or bike tour and seeing the sights through, um, through the, the Chinatown, through um, Tremont Street, through the South End and making your way to, to Nubian. And so that was an important piece for us. And, you know, I think during the early conversations, we, we had uh, conversations with folks uh, who lived in Roxbury and they wanted to know, you know, why wasn't the embrace in Roxbury? Uh, and so it was important for us to connect these pieces uh, together. It is, you know, and that's the long way, Liz, it's 2.7 miles, but, you know, that's, you know, that's like a blink of the eye. And so, you know, and I think it was important for us to make that connection that, that our city belongs to all of us. Nubian Square belongs to, anyone who wants to go there, uh, just like the park belongs to anyone who wants to go there. And so we want to create two welcome signs um, in, in every direction possible. Yeah, as you heard me say earlier, we're really looking to invite people to the common and make them feel welcome. And I love to see people go the other way and making sure that there's, you know, connecting tissue between both neighborhoods and all the neighborhoods of the city. That's right. I want to let you all know that we are open for questions. We've got a couple of minutes to talk to, to Mari. So, uh, if you have questions, we hear a little bit about, um, you know, the monuments invite a dialogue about the ideas that are embedded in those monuments. And as you heard, you know, the Shaw 54 catalyzed a, a, a several years of, of conversation. What do you want the story of the Kings? How do you want that story to challenge us? I mean, you talked about them seeing the testing ground for the ideal of freedom. And, and when I talk about the monument, Shaw 54, I, I think about people needing to feel inspired discomfort. It's important that people don't be sitting in their comfort zone, but they really see that it's a call to action. It's not just a, a place to be inspired. Yeah, yeah yes. And, 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 you know, Liz, and you and I talked about this uh, bef bef before, you know, Boston is going through um, a little bit of a, a, a renaissance and some, some national scholars refer to this moment in time as the third reconstruction. Right. And so a reconstruction is a, is a combination of an emergence of elected and civic leaders. And so we've seen the emergence of uh, Congresswoman Presley and our city council and our, our law enforcement officials and our DA. Uh, it's also about uh, civic uh, connectivity uh, and, and social gathering, social connectivity. And so I think in this moment in time, when, when you're putting a monument uh, that honors the kings and civil rights leaders, in a park, and, and you, 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 you helped me out because I said 20, 22 million people, but that invites seven to eight million people as, as the welcome center to our city. Uh, you, you, you sure as hell have to back up that monument with action. Yeah. And so, you know, Boston is one of the, I believe, one of the few cities in the country uh, that is actually prepared um, to, to back up that monument with action. We, we know that the Daughters of the American Confederacy constructed 450 memorials to the Confederacy um, in the 1920s. You know, there's over, you know, there's thousands of them, but 400 and, 425 were constructed in the 1920s. And so what does a sculpture say about the Confederacy? What does it say when it's in New Orleans? And what does it say when it's in Richmond? Uh, what does it say about your city? And so when, when we're putting a memorial in Boston Common, you know, our countries and, you know, Boston's uh, Welcome Center, it has to say that we are welcoming, that we are inclusive, that we're committed to the values of anti-racism and equity. And so I think that's a part of the, the, the process. And I think acti activists like you and me and others who are on this um, Zoom talk have been gathering and meeting and, and really interrogating the ways that we can open the city in a more welcoming way. And, and I think that's what gives me optimism. Right, absolutely. You know, I, I've talked about it as being a park within a park because I think it, there will be a huge interest in people coming. I think there's going to be a, a flowing of people that people that don't tend to come to the common. I hope they'll go to the other parts of the common and become familiar with it and comfortable with it and happy yes. being there. Um, and I know the Embrace Ideas is talking about some programming when it when it comes online. Have you thought any more about 
continue programming or this is sort of technical, but we thought we did an AR app for the Shaw 54 so that people who aren't there or who are there and don't get the deeper story can get a deeper story digitally with what they're looking at. Yeah, and I think we're, we're thinking of the same way too. You know, we, we imagine, you know, an app and several apps that as you're experiencing the, uh, the embrace and other parts of the park, but, it, but starting at the embrace, that you could stand over the plaque of Hubie Jones and link to a barcode and hear Hubie in his own words from an interview from say brother or an interview from, um, from, the, from a newsreel talk about what it was like and his experiences. And so we, we want the embrace to be interactive that it's, it is an outdoor history museum uh, in, our, in our park uh, that, that is coupled with other uh, important pieces of art within the common and so that connectivity between the embrace and the other pieces are incredibly important. So that that is one of the offerings that we're we're hoping to to develop as um, as we get closer to the date. Great, great. And you know, there is already a collection of twenty two pieces of art and, and some small things and some big things in the common. And we are in the process of developing a monument review task force to interrogate the ones that are there. Some of them need to be lifted up, and others need to be really questioned as to what what they're uh, depicting and and who is the story and, and which stories aren't there. I want to ask you a couple questions from the chat and they're, they're, they're concrete questions about the fabrication of the embrace, casting and, and installation. I mean, it's large and it's complicated and do you have any any details about that to share? Yes, and so it's, um, you know, the, the embrace, you know, we, we're committed to ensure that it's all um, fabricated within our country. Uh, and I think in this moment in time, it's important to support American workers. And so the fabrication of the memorial itself will take place uh, in a, at a foundry in outside of Seattle. Um, and so um, in, in, in the fall, Liz and, and some other, some other of, our, of us will probably head out to Seattle to see the, the miniature version of it. And so it will be brought on big trucks um, and uh, installed in two weeks. And so it is a two week process, but the entire fabrication of this this memorial will take 17 months for the bronze and the art to be uh, done in a way. Uh, the, 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 the plaza itself um, will, will take place um, probably within a three month period. And so we won't see any, any uh, um, shovels in the ground on the common until it's pretty close. I think the overall construction of the plaza itself will probably be three to four months um, and so with, with a 17 month time window, we don't imagine to unveil the embrace until October of 2022. And so I, I think roughly in the middle of the summer, you'll start seeing that small plaza of, um, um, of land on, on the common being, being rearranged to start putting down the, um, the granite um, steps and the, the, um, the um, quote wall for, from Mrs. King. Well, I think this is going to be the beginning of a long-term partnership and relationship with, with you. And uh, we'd love to join you in programming and thinking about opportunities and ways that we can animate this space and make it a meaningful place for people to be. Thank so, you, Liz. Thank you I'm so excited much about for being it. here, Amari. We really uh, are so honored that you could spend some time with us tonight. So we really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I have, uh, in the few minutes we have left here, I would like to see if Chris Cook is in the room and if he is to have him show his face because we want to say some nice things about him. <laughs> and uh, there Hi, Liz. Are. How are you? All right. How are you? Good. Good. Um, you all know that Chris is, uh, I'm glad, yeah, Leslie, come on. I, uh, we all know that Chris is uh, going to be chief of environment, energy, and open space for about two weeks more and then head off to be the executive director of the, of the Rose Kennedy Greenway Conservancy. And we didn't wanna let you slip away from one spot to another without coming and embarrassing you a little bit and talking about how wonderful it's been to be a partner with you from your time as parks commissioner to your time as chief. Um, he was a quick study, you guys. He did not start in the parks world. So we started one day, we had a tour with Chris very early on and uh, my our, uh, Common Committee Chair Beatrice Ness and I were walking around the, the common with him and I said, so Chris, there's this sort of gash in the in the ground that was created by, by first night. And he looked at this and he said, I did that. I did that. 
<laughs> I did that. So this is just an example of flooring us with your honesty. I got the article right here, Liz. I, I kept it on my desk so I never <laughs> forgot. Park and Rec in Boston. From Boston Globe. There you go. Yeah, so so uh, you've been a great partner to us, and we're glad that you're not going too far away because uh, Boston Park Advocates is going to come come after you. Yes. But um, Leslie uh, deserves ten thousand uh, awards. We worked on a, a gift for Chris, and, and and in the in the turn in the ways of of eleventh hour deadlines, <laughs> this is probably the most eleventh hour. Yeah. But we we uh, would like you to uh, open this this gift, and Leslie, if you want to say something before or after you open it, you can. Well, you know, um, Chris, it was great. I, I, I was sitting on the steps of Parkman waiting for Chris uh, this afternoon just before our event tonight. And so it was great to see him um, and congratulate him in person. But, you know, Chris has been an outstanding partner from our first meeting where, um, you know, we, we got off on an interesting start where I told you I thought we would do really well if we had regular meetings. Um, I went, you know, guns blazing down at uh, 1010 Mass Ave, but Chris has been great, um, always available to us and really understood our desire to create a world class park. And the best way to do that was to be able to work together and work with the city. And really, Chris made that happen and so many other people. But Chris, you know, we just thank you so much for all you've done for us. And um, it's been inspiring and we're glad that we're not losing you, that you're going to be a, a parks green space friend. Thank you. Uh, thank you both very much. Um, thank you to the friends of the public garden for everything that you've taught me and for the partnership. You know, we think about the Commonwealth Avenue mall and how it connects neighborhoods. And you think about the message that the public garden sends America's first public botanical garden so that everyone is welcome there. Beauty, is not excluded from people. Beauty is open to everybody and you guys protect that every day. And then Boston Common, America's first park and the message it sends the way that you're caring for it. I've been so grateful for the partnership. And you know, when I think about the future, about your impact is so beyond these three parks, you know, especially the work that you were just talking about your partnership with Amari and the way that you're actually gonna you know, move for fundamental change in parks and open space throughout the city. So I've just been incredibly grateful to the Friends of the Public Garden. Uh, two other quick things I have to say though. Uh, my best friend, Ryan Woods is the parks commissioner and I don't know what I'm gonna do without talking to him 75 times a day. Um, so maybe we'll try to get that down to two times a day. And then uh, just cause I know she's listening. I wanna thank, uh, my wife and my family for putting up for my public service over the past 15 years. Cause you have shared me a little bit with my family. My wife's my hero and um, she's taught me uh, a lot about, um, about life and about caring for other people. And that's why I give so much time to organizations like you who care so much about other people. So with that being said, if, uh, if anyone doesn't know this, um, if Leslie's looking for a second career, a FedEx <laughs> delivery person would be good. <laughs> Because Amazon's she, hiring. <laughs> she was, yeah, Amazon is expanding in Boston, Leslie. I don't know if you heard. So there are job opportunities for you. Um, I, I'm going to get in trouble because I just destroyed the most beautiful wrapping paper in the world. And I apologize. I just opened it up like a two year old. That is absolutely gorgeous. It's a beautiful, beautiful picture of America's first park. Thank you very much. I've been blessed to know you and I'm not going far. I'm going to be a partner forever. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Thank you so much. And thank you everyone for coming and being with us tonight. Um, it's wonderful to imagine you out there and I look forward to seeing you in real life next year. We, we, will, we will be together next spring. Uh, so thanks so much and everyone have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thank you.